As we continue our break this summer, we wanted to highlight a few series we've made on the opioid crisis, an issue that, sadly, remains critically important. We've covered various aspects of this crisis, from the history and science of opioids to the current epidemic of abuse and potential treatments. We hope you find this compilation both informative and thought-provoking, and we'll be back with new episodes soon. Opioids, a class of drugs originally derived from the opium poppy. We're going to talk about the history of these drugs, the science of how they work, their potential for abuse, and how we help people recover from addiction. Opioid drugs can be very, very dangerous, but they can also be extremely useful. According to one researcher, and I'm quoting, to understand the popularity of a medicine that eased, even if only temporarily, coughing, diarrhea, and pain, one only has to consider the living conditions at the time. Until the 20th century, cholera and dysentery regularly writ through communities, its victims often dying from debilitating diarrhea. Diseases like dropsy, consumption, ague, and rheumatism were very common. Opioids could be used to treat all of these things. But the line between useful treatment and harm is very blurry when it comes to opioids. And while they can be very effective in some respects, they can easily become deadly. This episode is brought to you in part with generous support from the National Institute of Healthcare Management. Humans have known about opioids and their pain-relieving and euphoria-inducing properties for a long, long time. We've known about them pretty much as long as we've been writing stuff down, and maybe even longer than that. As far back as 3400 BC, records indicate the poppy was grown in Lower Mesopotamia. Sumerians called it Hul Gil, or the joy plant. By 1300 BC, Egyptians were growing fields of it, and the opium trade was in full force all over the Mediterranean world. The Greek physician Hippocrates, who you might know from his Hippocratic Oath, used opioids to treat a number of diseases. Alexander the Great brought opium to Persia and India. In the 1300s, though, opium sort of disappeared for a couple centuries in Europe. Evidently, the Holy Inquisition didn't care too much for its use. Opioids had some undesirable social outcomes, like addiction and withdrawal, and besides, it came from foreign lands. And during the Inquisition, anything foreign was pretty much the work of the devil. By the 1500s, though, smoking opium was picking up again in Portugal. Laudanum was invented by Swiss polymath physician Paracelsus in the late 16th century. Paracelsus made his laudanum with a bunch of weird ingredients like crushed pearls and musk, but the real power of it was the potent combination of opium and alcohol. By the 1600s, England started importing opium from colonies in India. By the 1700s, the Dutch and the English were shipping it to China. The Chinese Qing Dynasty emperors tried to outlaw opium use, but it was unbelievably popular. And it was extremely profitable for the European merchants who were importing the stuff to China. In fact, it was so profitable that the English were willing to go to war with China not once but twice to keep the opium trade in business. Not only did these wars allow the English to keep the opium trade open in China, they set the stage for European powers to force the Chinese to sign all kinds of unfavorable trade deals. The British got an indefinite lease on Hong Kong, for example, which they would hold on to for over a hundred years, not returning the island to Chinese control until 1997. The 19th century saw a lot of advances in the science of opioids. In 1803, Friedrich Sir Turner, in Germany, discovered the active ingredient in opium, morphine. He managed to extract this active alkaloid, which allowed for much more potent opioids to enter the market. In 1827, E. Merck and Company began manufacturing morphine commercially, and in 1843, Alexander Wood figured out that you can inject morphine with a syringe. It was three times stronger when administered that way. These new opioid drugs had even more analgesic power, but they also had more powerful side effects, including euphoria and the addiction that could result from it. In 1895, Heinrich Dressy of the Bear Company discovered that diluting morphine with acetals produced a drug with fewer side effects. They coined the term heroin and started producing it commercially a few years later. In the early 1900s, free samples of heroin were sent to morphine addicts by mail to help them quit. As you can imagine, this didn't work out so well. Heroin addiction grew rapidly, and in 1905, Congress banned opium use in the United States. In 1910, the Chinese convinced the British to take down the India-China opium trade. In the United States, the Harrison Narcotics Act of 1914 took aim at doctors to slow the use of narcotics. About 10 years later, 
the Treasury Department's Narcotics Division banned all legal narcotics sales. This didn't stop its use, though. An underground economy and drugs arose to meet the demand for illegal opium and heroin throughout the United States. These drugs have become a growing source of profit for organized crime during the 20th century. In 1973, President Nixon had the Justice Department create the Drug Enforcement Administration to bring all the power of drug enforcement into one agency. The war on drugs kicked into high gear. In the 80s and 90s, the United States tried to strangle the drug trade wherever it was flourishing, with arguably little effect. Around this time, the most recent wave of opioid misuse began. In the medical community, the belief that use of opioids to control pain might be safe and effective was gaining traction. In 1980, Dr. Jane Porter argued in the New England Journal of Medicine that only four out of 12,000 patients who used narcotics became addicted. Another study published in the journal Pain in 1986 said that only two of 24 patients who had used narcotics for years had had any difficulties. This, coupled with a growing recognition that doctors were undertreating pain, led to increased use. By 1996, the American Pain Society labeled pain the fifth vital sign. And any doctor will tell you that pain measurement became an integral part of any clinical visit. The pharmaceutical industry brought their weight to bear as well. They created and marketed new drugs and funded lobbying organizations like the American Academy of Pain Management and the American Pain Society in an attempt to ease the regulation of opioid drugs. But concerns began to arise that pharmaceutical companies and researchers were overstating the safety of these medications. In 2007, the maker of OxyContin pled guilty to misleading regulators, doctors, and patients about the risk of addiction and potential for misuse of the drug. They were forced to pay about $600 million as a result. Other narcotic manufacturers paid huge fines for questionable marketing and misleading claims about safety. In 2003, the New York Times reported that more than 20% of young adults abuse prescription pain medications in the United States. Even so, the drumbeat continued for more and more treatment of pain. Ironically, we've been here before in the United States. This is actually the third wave of opioid abuse in the US. The first occurred in the late 1800s when Bayer started making heroin. It was being used more and more often for a wide variety of health problems. Huge amounts of money were being made and misuse was rampant. Policy responded by taxing the drugs, regulating their use, and treating addiction more widely. Following World War II, the United States saw a second wave of abuse. Veterans of that war, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War were addicted in large numbers. In response, the government passed laws allowing addicts to be hospitalized involuntarily. Methadone clinics were set up, and the DEA began to respond to the drug trade. Today we face similar problems. Opioids now cause more deaths than any other drugs. People in the United States consume 99% of the world's hydrocodone, 80% of the world's oxycodone, and 65% of the world's hydromorphone. Here's the problem. Pain is real. It's undertreated far too often. But opioids are dangerous, and it's becoming clear that they don't work that well for chronic pain. We need to help people who are addicted curb their overuse and also find alternatives for people who are suffering. We all know that analgesia, or pain relief, is the intended use of opioids like morphine. But before we can talk about how these compounds reduce pain, we need to discuss the physiology of pain perception. Let's start with some biology. The brain and the nervous system are made up of cells called neurons. Each neuron consists of a cell body, which runs the neuron's activity. The cell body has a number of dendrites which come off of it. These are short fibers that receive signals from other neurons and transmit them to the cell body. Also attached to the cell body is an axon, a long fiber that takes messages from the cell body and sends them to other dendrites and from there to other cell bodies. Axons can also end up in other tissues, like muscles, transmitting commands to them as needed. When nerves talk to each other, it's called neurotransmission. They do this by releasing chemical messengers, called neurotransmitters, across the spaces between cells, which are called synapses. The chemicals are released from the axons and are picked up by specific molecules called receptors in the dendrites. There are different receptors all over the body that send messages to your brain when they're exposed to stimuli. There are temperature receptors that tell you when you're feeling something hot or cold. Mechanical receptors let you know when you're touching something or something is touching you. There are even receptors that detect changes in pH. When stimuli are interpreted as being noxious, meaning that they could cause damage to our tissues, specialized receptors called nociceptors send signals to our brain. Nociceptors are located throughout the body, 
but we mostly think of them as being in the skin, the walls of organs, and deep within other body tissues like muscles and joints. So if you've ever mashed your finger with a hammer, splashed hot water on yourself while cooking, or rolled your ankle while playing sports, you can thank your nociceptors for sending a message to your brain all about the dumb thing you just did. We commonly refer to this message as pain, but nociceptors are kind of like the first leg of the journey that a pain signal takes to your brain. When we encounter noxious stimuli, like touching a hot stove, an electrical signal is sent up a primary afferent neuron to a part of the spinal cord called the dorsal root ganglion. There, electrical current causes a release of neurotransmitters that pass the pain signal from the primary afferent neuron to a secondary excitatory neuron. There are several neurotransmitters involved in pain signaling, but the major players are glutamate and substance P. The message is then sent up the spinal cord to different parts of the brain where it's interpreted as pain. One area of the brain that receives the signal is the thalamus, which helps give context to the message. The thalamus relays the message to the hypothalamus and limbic system, which help us learn from our pain and avoid touching hot stoves in the future. A downside to these parts of the brain receiving pain messages is that they can modify our behaviors and emotions about pain in ways that can be disruptive. Afraid of getting shots because of a traumatic childhood experience at the doctor's office? Yeah, that's probably not the nurse or pediatrician's fault. You can thank your limbic system for that one. So what does all of this have to do with opioids? Well, the cool thing about opioids is that they inhibit the pain signal at multiple steps in the pathway. They work in the brain, the spinal cord, and even in the periphery. In the brain, opioids have mood-altering effects, cause sedation, and can even decrease the emotional response to pain. Opioids block the signaling from the primary nociceptors to the secondary neurons. Opioids also work on neurons that descend from the brain stem to the spinal cord that function to modulate pain signals. Those descending pathways have fibers that either amplify or inhibit pain signals being sent to the brain. Opioid compounds suppress the fibers amplifying the signal and enhance the fibers that inhibit the signal. There's even evidence that opioids can work peripherally to decrease activation of primary neurons and inhibit immune and inflammatory responses to noxious stimuli. The fact is, opioid medications are so effective at treating acute pain because they attack it from every neurological angle. Let's get even more sciencey and technical for a second and talk about how opioids work with the neurons in the spinal cord. We'll focus on the area where the primary neuron is passing the pain signal to the secondary neuron. Remember, the space where the neurons meet is called the synaptic cleft. The influx of calcium ions causes the release of neurotransmitters into the synapse. Those neurotransmitters will float across the synapse and then bind with receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. This initiates a chain of events within the secondary neuron that further propagates the pain signal to the brain. There are specific opioid receptors on both the presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron. When an opioid compound attaches to a receptor on the presynaptic neuron, it decreases the amount of calcium ions that can enter the cell ultimately decreasing the amount of excitatory neurotransmitters that are released into the synapse. Opioids binding to their receptors on the postsynaptic neuron function to decrease the response to any of the neurotransmitters being released from the presynaptic neuron. The end result? Less pain. But wait a second. Why do our nerves have receptors that respond to a compound that miraculously diminishes pain? After all, it doesn't really make sense that mammals would evolve a specific receptor for the sap of the poppy flower. Humans have known about the analgesic effects of opium for millennia, but we wouldn't really be able to explain exactly why we had opioid receptors until the 1970s. It turns out that we have a built-in or endogenous analgesic system that modulates pain signals. These endogenous opioids, like beta endorphins, enkelfins, and dynorphins, are collectively known as endorphins, a name derived from endogenous morphine. See what they did there? So things are gonna get super duper sciencey here. The beta endorphins, enkelfins, and dynorphins interact with different opioid receptors to varying degrees, but one thing they all have in common is the tetrapeptide sequence tyrosine, glycine, glycine, and phenylalanine, or T-Y-R-G-L-Y-G-L-Y-P-H-E. This sequence is really important because it's needed for the endogenous opioid to interact chemically with the opioid receptor on a neuron. If this is hard to visualize, think of the opioid receptor as the car's ignition, and the tetrapeptide sequence as the key. If the key fits in the ignition just right, 
Then the opioid receptor will be activated and cause a series of changes in the neuron that decrease the pain signal. Opioid drugs and medications take advantage of this structure activity relationship. They bind to our opioid receptors in much the same way that endogenous opioids do, but with much more powerful consequences. There are three types of opioid receptors, mu receptors, kappa receptors, and delta receptors. When activated with an opioid agonist, like morphine, hydrocodone, or heroin, they will all produce analgesia, but each one comes with an unpleasant suite of side effects that we often associate with opioid use. Kappa receptor stimulation is associated with hallucinations and dysphorias, an overwhelming sense of dissatisfaction, anxiety, and restlessness. Delta and mu receptor agonism can cause respiratory depression because opioid stimulation in the midbrain suppresses the body's ability to appropriately detect carbon dioxide levels in the body. This can cause a person to simply stop breathing for a period of time. Other unpleasant side effects of opioid drugs are sedation, urinary retention, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, and really, really, really bad constipation. One might argue that the most catastrophic side effect of opioids is tolerance, meaning that higher and higher doses are required to get the same level of pain relief. The exact cellular mechanism behind tolerance is unclear, though there are many plausible theories. In any case, opioid tolerance is the harbinger of physical dependence and addiction. It's important to stress the difference between dependence and addiction. Dependence is the tolerance one develops over time and the withdrawal one suffers after stopping a drug. Addiction is a behavioral disorder that refers to the desire a person feels for the effects of a drug and the loss of control over their lives that they have in order to obtain it. Today we'll be looking at the treatment options available to those who are addicted or dependent on opioids. A drug addict unfortunately spends much of their day either high or sick. The goal of pharmacotherapy to help with addiction is to reduce the amount of time spent feeling sick without achieving the high. Unfortunately, we don't use this kind of therapy as often as we should. Part of that is economic. We expect insurers and public health groups to fund it, but the savings are realized by society at large. Asking insurers to pay for a program when the goals are a reduction in prison sentences doesn't always make sense to the insurers. Another reason is that therapy isn't well understood. Some people think that using drugs like methadone or buprenorphine is just swapping out one addiction for another. The media hasn't always helped with this perception. The best way to treat addiction is to prevent it. We all knew that too many prescriptions for opioid painkillers were being written. Policies were put in place to try and reduce the number of unnecessary prescriptions. In 2012, Blue Cross Blue Shield in Massachusetts started to require prior authorization for more than a one-month supply of opioids in a two-month period. In just a year and a half, this cut the number of prescriptions by more than six and a half million pills. Another issue is that many still feel like drug addiction is a moral failing rather than a personal and public health issue. Usually treatment begins with detoxification, where we try to beat the cycle of withdrawal. It often continues with rehab, either in the inpatient or outpatient setting, often with pharmacotherapy as well as behavioral therapy. Unfortunately, therapy often doesn't stick about half of those in rehab relapse. Behavioral treatments work to help patients learn to live without drugs, to overcome cravings, to avoid situations that could make drug use more likely, and to deal with relapses. The objective of treatment is to reduce dependence on drugs, to reduce morbidity and mortality caused by them, to improve mental and physical health, to prevent illicit behavior, and to help people re-enter society. Now, Trexone is an antagonist medication, which means that it blocks opioid receptors. When someone is given naltrexone, then the opioids don't really work. It can treat both overdoses and addiction, although it's not as widely used for addiction as people don't take it consistently or tolerate it well. If you stop taking it, you can also get high soon after. Methadone is a synthetic opioid agonist, meaning that it works much like opioids do. It acts on the same receptors in the brains that the other opioids do, and in doing so relieves withdrawal symptoms and reduces cravings for the drugs. Methadone is one of the most popular forms of treatment for addiction. It's been shown in research to reduce hospitalizations and emergency department visits, but those are only the direct costs. If you also include societal costs, like low productivity and crime, it's hard to argue that methadone therapy for opioid dependence isn't cost saving. It's a full mu opioid receptor agonist. It has a slow onset of action and a long elimination half-life, something like 24 to 36 hours. A longer acting derivative, known as levomethadoacetate, or LAM, exists as well. It is only taken three times a week, 
However, concerns about cardiac effects has made it less widely used than other drugs. Buprenorphine is a partial opioid agonist, meaning that it works both a bit like an agonist and an antagonist. It also reduces cravings and decreases symptoms of withdrawal. A number of randomized controlled trials have shown it to be significantly better than placebo. It's not clear, however, if it's superior to methadone. Buprenorphine is sometimes unfairly characterized, like many of these drugs, as synthetic heroin. But the drug is materially different than illicit opioids. One formulation, Suboxone, differs from other buprenorphine regimens in that it combines naloxone in the formulation, making a euphoric experience from either the buprenorphine or any other opioid pretty much impossible. All of these pharmacotherapy treatments have some problems, though. Demand for treatment programs is very high, and many of them have waiting lists. Access to these programs can be especially difficult in rural areas. Even after you get in, they're also very expensive. Insurers don't always pay for drug treatment programs, and many pharmacotherapy programs don't accept insurance even when it's willing to pay. Paying for office visits and medication can be a significant financial burden for those in recovery. It's important to remember that addiction leads to real changes in the brain. Withdrawal leads to real symptoms, including diarrhea, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, aches, pain, and changes in mood. Those are just words, though. The agony of withdrawal is very, very unpleasant, and people will do almost anything to avoid it. Finishing detox relieves the physical effects of addiction and withdrawal, but it's the social factors and psychological effects that lead people to relapse. Long-term maintenance therapy can help. Narcotics Anonymous is a 12-step program with a process to help people overcome addiction. It's abstinence-based, which means that it's opposed to the use of drugs in maintenance therapy. This can, of course, be controversial. Some counseling programs are more compatible with maintenance therapy. These can include cognitive behavioral therapies, like the SMART therapy program, motivational interviewing, and family therapy. Opioid abuse has become such a big problem that treatment is very, very important. Given the significant relapse rates, though, we need to continue to look for new and better ways to treat addiction. Overcoming the stigmas attached to treatment is a good start. Understanding addiction as a change in brain structure rather than a moral failing is essential. We also need further research and improvements in maintenance therapies and improved access to the treatments we have. We know we spent a lot of episodes on opioids recently, but they're a real problem for too many Americans. These powerful drugs have been in use by humans for a long time, and they're likely to remain a fixture on the human landscape into the foreseeable future, for better and for worse. Hopefully, a better understanding of how these drugs work, how they can help people, and how they can be dangerous dangerous will help us to get to a place where they can be used safely and for a short period of time. A recent report from the Society of Actuaries, or SOA, estimates that the economic cost of the opioid epidemic from 2015 to 2018 was over $631 billion. Approximately $205 billion of that was healthcare spending for those with opioid use disorder, for infants exposed to opioids in utero, and for related health issues of other family members of opioid users. The effects of the epidemic continue to be felt far and wide, beyond the money. As overdose deaths rise, so do calls to first responders. Access to and use of naloxone, a medication that quickly counters the effects of an opioid overdose, has quickly expanded among first responders, including non-paramedic first responders like police officers and firefighters. Naloxone administrations during emergency medical service events increased more than 75 percent between 2012 and 2016. Data also suggests that the frequency of multiple naloxone administrations to a patient by EMS providers a potential indicator of opioid potency, is increasing in some regions. In 2016, New Orleans reported more overdose deaths than murders for the first time in their history. Of the fatal overdoses reported, 78% were opioid-related, and EMS calls for opioid misuse rose from over 600 to almost 800 between 2015 and 2016. It's not just the healthcare system that's strained by the crisis, though. The criminal justice system accounts for about $39 billion of the economic cost we mentioned before. This includes things like police, court proceedings, and correctional facilities. The foster care system is also feeling the brunt while trying to provide temporary homes to children of addicted parents. Their resources, in terms of funding, social workers, and families are stretched thin, and those problems are further compounded by the need to place children who acquire extra care and attention following exposure to opiates in utero. According to the CDC, neonatal abstinence syndrome increased from 1.5 per thousand births in 2004 to 8 per thousand births in 2014. 
Government-funded child and family assistance and education programs also account for approximately $39 billion of the economic price tag we've discussed. In an effort to address the opioid crisis, major attention has turned to prescriptions in recent years. Opioid prescriptions per capita decreased between 2010 and 2015, but remained approximately three times higher than in 1999. In 2015, over 33,000 drug overdose deaths were opioid related, and close to half of those involved a prescription opioid. Given these numbers, it's hard to argue against initiatives that aim to regulate and reduce opioid prescriptions. However, Attempts thus far might be exacerbating the problem in unintended ways. In March of 2016, the CDC released guidelines for prescribing opioids for chronic pain treatment outside of cancer, palliative, or end-of-life care. Since their release, patient advocates, pain doctors, and others have stated concerns that the inappropriate use of the guidelines could negatively impact patients in need of pain management. For example, the CDC guidelines advise against dosages over 90 morphine milligram equivalents per day, but this is meant for patients just starting an opioid prescription for short-term pain, not for patients who've been taking opioids regularly for chronic pain. For those patients, Sudden tapering or discontinuation of long-term opioid prescriptions can result in extreme withdrawal, pushing some to illicit opioids like fentanyl and pushing others as far as attempting suicide. Though deaths resulting from prescription opioid overdoses have slowed, deaths attributed to illicit opioids have increased alarmingly. While a 2019 systematic review reports a lack of research on how and to what extent current laws are associated with opioid deaths, research on that connection is sorely needed. Chronic pain patients rely on strictly controlled doses to help them function despite their chronic pain, which is a different scenario than life-disrupting addiction. While data suggest effective non-opioid options for managing chronic pain, there's still not enough research to determine the full picture. And in any case, we just can't turn off the use of those drugs overnight, at least not safely. According to a 2019 review, more than half of the states in the U.S. have laws constraining opioid use for acute pain, most of which were enacted after the 2016 CDC guidelines were introduced. But despite their designation for acute pain, patients with cancer or chronic pain issues are often affected. Physicians are having to balance their patients' well-being with concern over legal repercussions, and insurance companies and pharmacies are using the CDC guidelines to impose strict prescription limits. These strict limits ignore the fact that the guidelines do not suggest an automatic cutoff of 90 morphine milligram equivalents per day, but rather suggest that physicians use caution and appropriate justification when prescribing above that limit. And as many physicians are pointing out, these are guidelines, not mandates. A March 2019 letter to the CDC, signed by numerous medical experts, called for clarification, in no uncertain terms, that these guidelines do not mandate involuntary tapering or sudden discontinuation of opioids in chronic pain patients, and that the plan of action for these patients be determined by a physician who's aware of the nuances of each patient's situation. The letter was accompanied by hundreds of testimonials from pain patients struggling with the after effects of new regulations. Medical experts certainly aren't against regulations aiming to stem the tide of the opioid crisis, but those regulations should be ethical and effective. A 2019 ethics evaluation of regulatory interventions for opioid prescribing did not deem it ethical to enact strict prescribing limits that do not consider situational and patient characteristics. Regulatory authorities seem to be listening. In April of 2019, the CDC director issued the clarification requested by medical experts. And in mid-2019, the authors of the CDC guidelines released a paper addressing inappropriate implementation of the guidelines. The FDA also jumped in last year, requiring that warning labels include information about the risks of rapid tapering. We'll need studies, of course, to understand how all of this plays into the larger picture of licit and illicit opioid overdoses and deaths. As we mentioned in our first opioid series, the best way to treat addiction is to prevent it, which is one reason why understanding the effects of opioid prescription practices and the effects of changing regulations is so important. In the meantime, what new efforts are we making to address the crisis and what more do we need to do? There are ongoing efforts to improve treatments for opioid misuse and addiction, including the NIH HEAL initiative, which was established in 2018 and aims to fund scientific research on lasting solutions to the crisis. As part of that initiative, the Justice Community Opioid Innovation Network, or JCOIN, 
was formed in 2019 to support nationwide research on improving opioid-related treatment within the criminal justice system. Research is now being conducted to determine treatment gaps and effective strategies in criminal justice settings such as jails, drug courts, and probation and parole. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has also allocated funds to provide training and medication to EMS personnel to support services for pregnant and postpartum women and children affected by opioid use disorder and to expand access to medication and to long-term recovery support. A 2019 report from the National Science and Technology Council reported on the state of the science in relation to the opioid crisis as well as current research gaps. Research continues to support the effectiveness of medicines such as methadone, buprenorphine, and extended-release naltrexone. It also emphasizes the importance of individualized treatment versus one-size-fits-all, with that treatment including medicine as well as psychosocial support such as Narcotics Anonymous and Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Recent data also tell us that individuals receiving only short-term treatment are at high risk of relapse. Long-term, evidence-based care is critical. The report also nods to research in neuroscience that sheds light on opioid-induced molecular changes and altered addiction pathways in the brain. Data like these may play a big role in shaping attitudes surrounding addiction, namely that addiction is not a moral failure, but a behavioral result of physical changes in the brain. Lastly, the report highlights gaps in the research that still need to be assessed. We need longer-term studies that we can generalize to more populations, such as patients in rural settings or those with mental and physical comorbidities. We need more research on the specific needs of vulnerable populations, including pregnant and postpartum women. Research on how to effectively implement treatment in non-specialty settings will also be critical moving forward. There are contributors to the opioid epidemic outside of prescription practices. Drug overdose deaths are called deaths of despair, and those deaths are a big reason that U.S. life expectancy actually began to decrease in 2014. For the most part, life expectancy has been on the rise in the United States in the last 60 years. However, that rise began to slow in comparison to other wealthy nations until it became an overall decrease in 2014. While many issues, including obesity, have contributed to this decrease, a large portion of it has been attributed to deaths of despair. These deaths are associated with states of substantially increased psychological stress and result from alcoholism, drug overdoses, and suicides. In 2017, Overdose deaths hit a new record in the United States at around 72,000, becoming the leading cause of death for Americans under 55. In 2018, close to 47,000 overdose deaths were opioid-related, with two-thirds of them involving synthetic opioids. As we discussed in last week's episode, steps have been taken to address overprescribing of pharmaceutical opioids, but patients who are already addicted may be turning to synthetic sources when their prescriptions are limited or cut off. Because synthetic drugs are more potent and sometimes mixed with other substances when made illegally, they are generally deadlier than their prescription counterparts. Between 2013 and 2018, overdose deaths associated with synthetic opioids increased from around 3,000 to over 28,000. Part of the problem lies in opioid prescribing trends, with opioid prescriptions being significantly higher in rural areas. But beyond questionable prescription practices, many other factors have been proposed to play a role, factors that contribute to the label deaths of despair. One of the most prominent suggestions is that in places hit hardest by the epidemic, distress over deteriorating economic conditions coupled with inadequate formal and informal safety nets may shoulder much of the blame. According to the Brookings Institution, deaths of despair are highest in places where blue-collar jobs like manufacturing are disappearing. Between 1997 and 2003, approximately 1.5 million rural workers lost their jobs. Job loss is associated with severe stress for both the individual and their families, impacting economic security, self-esteem, physical health, marital and parental discord, and likelihood to abuse alcohol and other substances. Adjusting to job loss is typically more difficult in rural areas, which further complicates the issue. So perhaps not surprisingly, Deaths of despair have increased alongside job losses, and the rate of overdose deaths in rural areas has been higher than that of urban areas since 2006. Though overall mortality rates have increased for all races and levels of education, overdose deaths appear to be highest among white adults with less education. This is partly due to racial disparities in medicine. 
because opioids have been prescribed to whites at far higher rates for a variety of race-related reasons, such as baseless stereotypes about race and drug use. Data suggests that racial differences in subjective well-being in rural areas may also play a part. Low-income white people in rural areas report lower well-being when assessing measures such as life satisfaction and levels of stress and of hope when compared to their black and Hispanic counterparts. This appears to be associated with the data on deaths of despair. Absence of hope reported among less educated whites lines up with CDC data on premature mortality among 35 to 64 year olds. These difficulties are thought to be due at least in part to cultural differences in religiosity, connectedness, and social support. Though more research is needed, some have also speculated that these dissimilarities in well-being find root in the different perspectives between these groups who have had very different experiences and economic opportunities in our country's history. In addition, Less educated whites living in rural areas are more likely to report pain and display strong anti-government sentiment, making it difficult to implement policies or programs meant to help. Not to be forgotten in the web of opioid use and deaths of despair is the significant relationship between opioid use, opioid use disorder, and suicide. Though it's been difficult to understand the exact nature of this relationship, data suggests that some percentage of opioid overdoses involve suicidal intent. Other data suggests that the frequency of prescription opioid misuse is significantly associated with thoughts of suicide, with individuals misusing prescription opioids being twice as likely to attempt suicide as those who did not. While the most recent data show the first uptick in life expectancy since 2014, we still haven't fully recovered the loss, settling in an average of 78 8.7 years compared to our high of 78.9 in 2014. Declines in cancer death were the largest driver of the recent increase, and while a decrease in overdose deaths played a part, the numbers are still high, and deaths from suicide remained on the rise. So what do we do about it? For starters, we can avoid cutting funds to organizations like the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, whose mission is to reduce the impact of substance abuse and mental illness in America's communities, and whose budget is repeatedly threatened by proposed cuts. We can focus resources on financial assistance and retraining after job loss, with particular focus on the nuances of job loss in rural areas. We should also consider investing time, energy, and money into community engagement efforts building up informal safety nets of social support. Given the higher number of opioid prescriptions reported in rural areas, working on evidence-based prescribing practices in these healthcare systems may also be critical. However, for reasons discussed in our last episode, this would need to be done carefully. And we can definitely work on improving healthcare for affected individuals. Only one in five people in need of drug treatment in the United States will receive care. And despite data on the effectiveness of medication to alleviate addiction, only half of that one in five will receive it. If we refuse to effectively support people facing factors that significantly undermine their well being, and if we refuse to stretch a net under individuals in desperate circumstances, and if we refuse to provide better treatment and support to affected individuals, a resulting struggle with deaths of despair seems no wonder at all. We're still largely failing to stem the opioid crisis. This failure is happening on many levels, not the least of which is lack of access to medication-assisted therapy, or MAT. MAT is the use of drugs such as methadone, naltrexone, or buprenorphine to treat opioid use disorders. These are well-established treatments that are associated with significantly improved opioid abstinence and decreased mortality. But access barriers are rampant. For starters, we aren't turning to MAT when addicted patients show up at the hospital. When compared with opioid-dependent patients placed on a detoxification regimen on admission, those placed on a buprenorphine induction protocol and treatment upon discharge reported significantly less illicit opioid use six months later. Other data suggests that initiating buprenorphine treatment at hospital admission significantly reduces the chances of both 30 and 90-day readmissions. But despite these and other data, a 2016 study reported that among 102 patients hospitalized with heart infections related to injection drug use, fewer than 25% were given addiction consultations and fewer than 8% were discharged with the plan for MAT. This could be due in part to low MAT availability. Medication for opioid addiction is offered at fewer than half of U.S. addiction treatment facilities. In addition, 
There are huge portions of the United States where there are too few to no doctors that can prescribe buprenorphine, leaving an enormous number of addicted individuals without this treatment option. It seems like there's tighter regulation of the medications that treat opioid use disorder than there are of the medications that cause it. Physicians with licenses from the Drug Enforcement Administration can write prescriptions for oxycodone and fentanyl, but they need extra training before they're given a waiver that allows them to prescribe buprenorphine. Among other things, physicians cite this eight-hour training as a significant barrier to being an MAT provider. Addiction specialists have argued against the waiver requirement, citing outcomes in countries like France, where a substantial decrease in opioid deaths was seen after regulations on buprenorphine administration were eased. As of now, though, the waiver remains a requirement here in the United States. Other moves have been taken to address barriers to MAT. The California Bridge Program is working to make hospitals and emergency rooms primary access points for addiction treatment, and a handful of universities and medical centers are working to ensure in-hospital addiction treatment. Let me be clear, though, that a lot more effort is required. To repeat something I said just a minute ago, the majority of addiction treatment centers in the United States do not offer MAT, an effective evidence-based treatment for addiction. This could be due in part to stigma. We'll discuss that in just a minute, but first we want to talk about policy. The paper released in 2018 used a modeling approach to project addiction-related deaths in the United States in response to potential policy fixes to the opioid epidemic. They examined policy changes aimed at preventing new cases of opioid use disorder, like reducing prescription rates, expanding opioid disposal programs to reduce inappropriate use of leftover prescriptions, and reformulation of opioids to deter tampering and abuse. They also examined policy changes aimed at existing cases of opioid use disorder, like expanding availability of MAT, psychosocial treatment, naloxone availability, and needle exchange programs, which prevent deaths from things like HIV contracted by a needle sharing. They also projected the effects of enhancing provider access to and use of prescription drug monitoring programs to support appropriate prescribing and to identify misuse among patients. Over a 10-year period, Changes to opioid prescription policies related to acute pain were projected to prevent around 9,000 deaths, whereas changes related to chronic pain and prescription monitoring programs were actually projected to increase deaths. As we discussed in the first episode of this series, it's critical to change the way we prescribe opioids, but caution and awareness of individual circumstances will also be critical to avoid making things worse. The projected number of lives saved due to drug reformulation was 3,900. Disposal of excess opioids accounted for a projected 2,400. Expanding needle exchange programs was projected to save almost 6,000 lives, and expanding psychosocial treatment could save another 7,500. Expanding access to MAT was projected to save 12,500 lives, and expanding naloxone availability made the biggest impact that a projected 21,200 lives saved over the 10-year period. The authors project that without intervention, we would see upwards of 500,000 opioid-related deaths over 10 years. When combining the appropriate policy approaches, they project we could reduce that by around 11%. That's a lot. The important takeaway is that no single approach will do it. Rather, a combination of the most effective policies is the key to saving a significant number of lives. Multifaceted problems require multifaceted solutions. We need to take action where possible to halt addiction before it starts, reducing unnecessary exposure to opioids and taking steps to screen for and safeguard at-risk individuals, including the steps mentioned in our episode on deaths of despair. But we won't catch everyone there, and some are already past that point, so we'll need more nets. We must plan for both the immediate and long-term needs of those affected by addiction. We need naloxone to save lives in the most desperate moments. After that, we need evidence-based treatments like MAT and psychotherapy to help affected individuals move forward. We need these treatments to be easily accessible on all levels. Building up this kind of system will also require a lot more money than we've been giving it. But many people disagree with their tax dollars being spent on something like methadone treatment. Which brings us to stigma. Addressing this crisis will require us to address it in a big way. There's no shortage of stigma when it comes to addiction, and its presence leads to a decrease in both treatment availability and the likelihood of addicted individuals to seek treatment when it is made available. Addiction is commonly regarded as a moral failing rather than a disease, and treatments like MAT are seen as just replacing one drug for another. 
As an excellent Vox article points out, these beliefs lay bare a misunderstanding of how addiction works. Americans use drugs all the time. They partake in substances like caffeine and alcohol while receiving far less backlash than individuals using opioids. Opioids put an individual at high risk of overdose and of severe withdrawal that often leads to poor and or unacceptable behaviors that negatively affect themselves and those around them. Using appropriate medications, we can alleviate the cravings that lead to these risks and behaviors without producing a high, helping to ameliorate the outcomes that make opioid use such a problem. We use this approach with other modes of addiction as well, for example, when we offer drugs like Chantix or alternate methods of nicotine exposure to help people quit smoking. For improved opioid policies to be passed and become useful, we must work towards reducing stigma by educating policymakers and the public at large about opioid addiction, withdrawal, and successful treatment. We need to help them understand that behaviors exhibited by addicted individuals stem from physical changes in the brain and body caused by the drug, not from some kind of character flaw leading them to make choices that destroy their relationships, income, and security. We may also need to address perceptions within the medical community about who handles this disease and how. Physicians report a lack of formal or informal training in addiction treatment, as well as a general perception that this type of treatment is relegated to outpatient settings with psychiatrists. And last but not least, we'll need to remove financial barriers, including those related to insurance. Lack of insurance coverage or rules that make coverage especially difficult are often reported as barriers to treatment. There's a great lack of parity when it comes to addiction treatment and insurance, meaning insurance companies have different rules for covering addiction than they do other diseases and disorders. Coverage can be delayed or denied based on specific requirements for prior authorization or accessory services like drug tests or attendance of 12-step programs. Some insurance programs exclude medications for substance use disorders altogether. Complicated rules for addiction treatment plague programs like Medicaid, which is a particular concern given that individuals with opioid use disorder are often reliant on public programs and funding for help. If not covering this seems reasonable to you, consider that we don't make insurance coverage for heart attacks contingent upon individuals proving they haven't been smoking or that they've been to see the dietitian and joined a weekly exercise program. We don't complicate their medical care because we assume they made bad choices. We assume that whatever factors are relevant to their situation will be dealt with between them and their doctor. And in the meantime, we save their lives. We hope you enjoy this episode and you'll enjoy these other episodes that are part of this series. We'd especially also like it if you like and subscribe down below. And if you consider going on over to patreon.com slash healthcare triage, where you can help make the show bigger and better. We'd especially like to thank our research associates, Joe Sevitz, Joshua Gister, and James Glasgow. And of course, our Surgeon Admiral Sam. Thank you.